The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexander. I'm the IOF Asia Pacific representative. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on treatment presented by Professor Igo Simon. Professor Igo Simon, thank you for your time tonight to dedicate an hour of your time on this uh, important session. Um, before we start, I just wanted to provide a few guidelines on webinars. This uh, webinar will last for a maximum of 60 minutes from which 30 to 35 minutes will be dedicated to uh, Professor Simon's presentation, followed by 10 to 15 minutes question and answers. Um, as an introduction, Professor Simon has worked in the field of bone biology for 35 years, studying the epidemiology, pathogenesis and treatment on, of bone fragility. Uh, Professor Simon has been the past president of the Australian and New Zealand Bone Mineral, bone, sorry, um, bone Mineral Society, and has uh, won numerous awards throughout his career. Professor Simon, thank you. The floor is yours. You can now start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the IOF for uh, inviting me uh, to, to give this uh, lecture, and it's a great pleasure to do so. And I'd like to thank those participants who are giving up their time to come and have a I listen to what I have to say, and I hope that uh, there will be some benefit to you. My talk will be divided into two parts. The first part is a fairly brief clinical run through of features of things that I think are important. They are uh, not complicated, um, uh, but I think they're important clinical principles to understand. The second part is, I believe, much more interesting. It is much more challenging to understand, and it concerns some principles of bone remodeling and how these principles help us understand the mechanism of action of the anti-resorptive drugs, defining both their, uh, their, the good things about them and the limitations of the anti-resorptive. And the, then that will be followed by a discussion of the bone building drugs and how really important they are. And I think that we're coming to a time now uh, where, where many people are starting to recognize that in some ways, uh, first-line therapy should not always be anti-resorptive therapy, but in some circumstances that I must say are yet to be defined, it may be appropriate to commence therapy with anabolic agents to be followed by anti-resorptive agents subsequently. So yeah, let me summarize some clinical aspects. Why do we treat people? Well, we treat people because they have fractures and fractures hurt. Who and when should we start? And that depends on the absolute risk of fracture. In other words, we want to target our treatment to those who are going to fracture in the next one to two or three years. Uh, it is difficult to determine who will fracture in 10 years' time. So really attention is to the, the contemporary situation now and finding those people who are at imminent risk for fracture and treating those women not after the first after the first fracture but before the first fracture we want to prevent all fracture events the first and all subsequent events what drug should we choose that's a very simple answer to that we choose the drugs upon which there is evidence for their efficacy and i'll go through that how long should we treat i believe the treatment should be indefinite I do not believe that drug holidays are appropriate management. Um, stopping hypertensive, antihypertensive therapy results in blood pressure increasing. Stopping uh, lipid lowering drugs results in the rise in serum cholesterol. And when we stop anti-resorptive drugs or bone building drugs, the benefits are lost. I'd like to give one message to you that I'd like you to think about. I don't know how many of you use bone remodeling markers, but I believe that they are clinically very useful. They are helpful both as a scientist and as a doctor attempting to give hope and positiveness to our patients 
who after all are frightened and they come to the doctor in fear because they're worried about their lives, how long they will live and what quality of life. Measuring the fasting CTX gives us an easy method of saying to a patient, well, your bone remodeling is rapid, you're losing bone, I have a blood test that I can do that when I give you treatment, that blood test switches off and the blood level uh, of the remodeling marker goes down and we can explain to the patient, look, your blood test has dropped from 800 units down to under 100 units, undetectable, so you're no longer losing bone. I find that a practical and helpful thing for patients because we don't need to wait for one or two years for changes in bone density and before we can tell our patients that the drug is working. So if you get just this point from my lecture, I'll be quite happy about things. So what is the burden of fractures? There are three burdens of fractures that I want to draw your attention to. The first one is most fractures occur in women over 70 years of age. In terms of the number of fractures, most of the burden is in women, women 70 to 80 years of age and increasingly women in their 90s as individuals are living longer. In impaired function, also women 70 to 80 years of age impose the biggest burden to the community and in terms of cost to themselves and cost to the community, women 70 to 80 years of age also represents the burden of disease. And so when you see people in this age group, you're, the signal that you should be thinking about treating these individuals should be very, very high. The next burden is osteopenia. We know that as we measure bone density, the lower the bone density, and this being minus 2.5, the fracture threshold for osteoporosis, the incidence of fractures increases as bone density decreases. However, because women under, with bone density under minus 2.5 represent only a small proportion of the total population, they contribute only 25% of all of the fracture events. Because of this population distribution, most women in the community have osteopenia or so-called normal bone mineral density. There is no such thing as normal bone density in a postmenopausal woman. They have structural decay in their skeleton, despite this level of my, having a bone density above this level of minus one standard deviation T-score. And you can see in, in this particular study by Ethel Cirrus, 75% of all of the fractures occurred in women without osteoporosis. The problem with that and the challenge with that is if you see a patient who happens to have a bone density that is less reduced than minus 2.5, say minus 2.4 or minus 2.3, this does not mean they are free of fracture. Also, if they have a fracture and they have only osteopenia, that does not mean the fracture was due to severe trauma. There still may be underlying bone fragility. The challenge that we have, and we are meeting it slowly, but we're still not very successful, is how do we identify those women without osteoporosis who will come to form the burden of fractures in the community? And several ways have been described. Work is now going on to look at the microstructure of bone to see if we can identify women who have who have osteopenia but also have microstructural decay that can signal that we should be targeting the women these women for treatment and the the future is is optimistic and we're succeeding in this now the third burden is non-vertebral fractures 
The history of osteoporosis with Fuller Albright began, of course, with spine fractures and the dowager's hump and the concentration on spine fractures here. But that is not the burden of disease. Spine fractures only involve about 10% of all fractures. Most of them are non-hip, non-vertebral fractures, and these are the ones that are causing a high burden of disease and high cost that together is approximately equal to that incurred by hip fractures that are uncommon in younger women, but much more common in older women, and of course can kill and certainly uh, result in a loss of independence of many, many people. So these are the three sources, women over 70, women with osteopenia, and women suffering non-vertebral fractures. Here's the challenge of the big part of the cake that we need to be identifying and treating. So how do we do that? So there are factors in the patient, factors with the bone, and factors with the drugs that help us make our decisions. Persons who are older, who have chronic illness, propensity to falls, have low body weight, frailty, and what patients' wishes may be, these should be influencing and helping us make decisions. The presence of a fracture is an enormously important risk factor for future fractures and should certainly be a signal that we need to be considering therapy. Low BMD, but as I said, that alone will miss a lot of people. High bone remodeling and the use of remodeling markers to help us identify women who have rapid remodeling. And because they are postmenopausal, then when they're rapidly remodeling, they are decaying that skeleton. And the decay of microstructure, and you'll be seeing lots of literature coming out to help us use this technology to identify women. Uh, in terms of drug, we are drugs, we are concerned first about the efficacy, second about the safety or equally the efficacy and safety, and of course the convenience. And we really do have drugs that are easy to take. In general, they are very safe and they are effective, but perhaps not as effective as uh, we would like them to be. And there's work to be done in that area. Which drug should you choose? The drug you should choose is based on evidence of anti-fracture efficacy against non-vertebral fractures, hip fractures, and vertebral fractures. You have no choice. You have the choice of three drugs. I don't care which drug you choose, just choose one of them either recidronate or actinel, zoledronic acid, or denosumab. All of these three drugs have been shown in randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials to reduce the risk of all three classes of fractures. Alendronate is not in my top three or four list, but it's there because the non-vertebral fracture risk reduction was not found by intent to treat. It was found by a post hoc analysis of the data. Vertebral and hip fractures were reduced. And do I believe alendronate reduces non-vertebral fractures? Yes, I do believe it. But my duty is to give you the evidence for the efficacy. Strontium ranolate is really no longer available. Raloxifene or Avista reduces vertebral fractures. There's no evidence that it reduces hip or non-vertebral fractures, and I cannot support its use. Um, teriparatide is, reduces non-vertebral fractures and vertebral fractures. Uh, we now have abiloparatide, a new drug that is available in the United States, uh, not elsewhere as far as I know. It reduces vertebral and may reduce non-vertebral fractures. There's some argument about that. Romososumab uh, is a drug that's not on the market yet. Calcitonin, calcitriol, calcium and vitamin D. I cannot support the use of calcitriol or calcitonin. I don't believe there is good evidence for it. 
Calcium and vitamin D, I don't know. And I want to show you some data. And the reason that I don't know is because the trials looking at calcium and vitamin D have not been designed or executed with sufficient excellence to allow us to make inferences, in my opinion, to make inferences about either their efficacy or their safety. So let me talk to you about vitamin D a little bit. And the message that I want to give you is that try to avoid labeling patients as being vitamin D insufficient just because their vitamin D levels are not above 70 nanomoles per liter. The evidence supporting the concept of an insufficiency state is not very good. And I want to show you this evidence just fairly briefly. So if there's not sufficient vitamin D, there's a reduction in the production of 125, which causes malabsorption. But the reduction in vitamin D is not found until the 25 hydroxy levels of vitamin D are below 10 nanomoles per liter. In this range here of between 30, where deficiency is defined, the levels of vitamin D are not low. In, a, in the same way, calcium malabsorption is only detected when the vitamin D level gets below 10 nanomoles per liter, not 30. It's still normal at 30 nanomoles per liter. If we look at, as you will recall from medical school, that when the calcium absorption goes down, the serum calcium goes down, and this increases PTH, which increases the rate of bone remodeling. And if we look at levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D here, even below 30, the, de the definition of vitamin D deficiency, the vast majority of people with blood levels below 30 do not have elevated PTH levels driving the high remodeling state and then subsequently leading to malabsorption to uh, and a decrease in serum phosphate and then a decrease in the calcium phosphate product and so osteomalacia. When we look at osteomalacia and when we actually go to the essence of what might be vitamin D deficiency, when we look at bone biopsies, again, even below 30, the volume of osteoid, the red bone, the osteoid, which is unmineralized bone, that in, for most patients, 600 subjects here, for most patients, they do not have hyperosteoidosis. This does occur and it does occur in a small percentage of people with insufficiency, but it's pretty uncommon. The message that I'm trying to convey is don't give patients a disease that will frighten them, frighten them and cause them stress and be moderate about the, the notion of vitamin D deficiency. When we look at clinical trials, uh, look, using calcium and vitamin D. In nursing homes, there is clear evidence of a reduction in fracture risk compared to placebo controls. But when we look in the community studies, we do not find efficacy in replacement of vitamin D uh, therapy in patients in the community. This may partly be a, a problem in the design of the studies in that in the community, many of these patients may not have been vitamin D deficient in the first place. Now, when we look at another trial, and this trial was done by Kerry Sanders in, in Melbourne, Australia, and it was published in the JAMA, and it shows that in the vitamin D supplemented group, fall rates were higher with vitamin D than the controls and fracture risk was higher in the vitamin D supplement than controls. And so this just adds to the 
really to the confusion, but it illustrates that we really do have a lot to learn and that we need to be quite careful about labeling people with a disease and then giving them treatment that may or may not increase or decrease fracture rates. If we look at meta-analyses, where you take lots and lots of different trials, all of them with issues, either the sample sizes are small, the duration of follow-up is small, and then, and then investigators put these trials together. And even when we put all of these trials together, the benefit of the risk reduction for fractures using calcium or calcium and vitamin D is, excuse me, is only about 12% based on the analysis of combined many, many trials. What this means to me is, I don't know, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure what to recommend, but I do believe under those circumstances, moderation is the appropriate way to go. One of the final clinical points I want to make before moving on to the more complex things is this issue about drug holidays and stopping treatment. Dentists are concerned about stopping everybody's bisphosphonates because of the risk of fracture. But have a look at the risk that when you take osteonecrosis of the jaw or atypical fractures with prolonged therapy, these events per 100,000 person years are very, very uncommon. By contrast, women with moderate risk for fracture or high risk for fracture the risk of having a typical fracture is a hundred times higher or more than a hundred times higher than the risk of these uncommon adverse events of osteonecrosis of the jaw. This is a patient of mine who had a hole there. I gave her parathyroid hormone and that healed completely. This is an atypical fracture. No question about it. It's a nasty fracture. It's terrible. And it may be bilateral, but these are rare events. So let's not throw away our treatment and allow these people to be fracturing to prevent some very uncommon events. So that's the end of the first part of some principles that I'd like to get across to you. And I hope that uh, please feel free to ask questions, write them down, and I'll attempt to answer them. I want to now turn my attention to bone remodeling because I believe that bone remodeling is not well understood. I believe that without understanding it, we cannot understand how the drugs we use work properly. We know that the remodeling cycle is as shown here, that initially there's some resorption of bone, and this is followed by filling in of the resorption cavity with bone formation, with the deposition of osteoid, which is unmineralized bone, that osteoid undergoes mineralization. However, these three events in the remodeling cycle are not bang, instantaneous. There is a time lapse between them. And that slowness and the different timing of each of these phases produces what's called a transient, fully reversible deficit in the bone matrix volume and its mineral content. This deficit is what is replaced when we give anti-resorptive therapy. This deficit differs from another deficit, which is that produced by the imbalance in the remodeling cycle. That deficit is produced when the hole that is dug is incompletely refilled with new bone, leaving one to 2% of a negative remodeling balance, which produces irreversible microstructural decay that is responsible for bone fragility and that does not, is not repaired by anti-resorptive drugs, but requires anabolic therapy. That's the message of the slides coming up. So let me explain. So you dig a hole with osteoclasts here during three weeks. Then there is a lag phase called the reversal phase 
of about a week when precursor cells are recruited and coupling occurs between the volume of bone resorbed and the deposition of new bone, which refills the hole during three months. The osteoid undergoes what's called primary mineralization. Crystals of calcium hydroxyapatite quickly increase the mineral content of this osteoid to about 80% of its maximum. The remaining 20% is called secondary mineralization, which is a slower phase lasting maybe two years or more, where the crystals deposited during primary mineralization enlarge, displacing water from the collagen fibril, resulting in stiffening of the collagen fibrils and increasing the brittleness of the bone. So in the normal remodeling cycle, at some locations, there's bone resorption here and here. At other locations, in remodeling sites that were in the resorptive phase earlier, these are now in their refilled state undergoing various degrees of primary mineralization. And so this process in premenopausal women is balanced. There's always a deficit present, and the deficit is determined by the number of remodeling units, turning over the skeleton, and the, the phase of the remodeling that each of these units is in. Bone density remains stable because as this hole refills, a new site appears emptying the hole. So there's always this ever-present global deficit in the volume of mineral and the volume of matrix, but this is transitory at a given point. So during normal remodeling, there is a deficit determined by the rate of an individual's remodeling rate. At menopause, the rate of remodeling increases. Now, there are many more remodeling sites in various stages of their remodeling balance. If at menopause, the only abnormality that was present is an increase in the rate of remodeling, then the bone density would decrease, but then level off. And it would stay at a level that is determined by the new number of remodeling sites that are turning over the skeleton. But that's not the only abnormality that occurs uh, after menopause. There is what I said before, there is the negative balance. Now the new part of the deficit appears that there is an imbalance. So no longer now does this hole that has been dug refill completely, it refills but does so incompletely because the formation goes down and the resorption actually also goes down in that cavity. So the cavity that's dug is actually more shallow, but even less bone is put in the more shallow cavity, leaving this negative balance that is the necessary and the sufficient cause of irreversible microstructural decay that causes bone fragility, which is a word that we mean usually when we say osteoporosis. We really mean bone fragility and we really mean the structural decay of that skeleton. So, in because of 
the two abnormalities, the increase in the rate of remodeling, so more of the bone is being turned over. And now the negative balance in each remodeling site, there is structural decay. The trabeculae break up, the cortical bone becomes more porous, and there is a decrease in strength of the bone that is disproportionate to the bone loss that is producing the microstructural decay. And so bone density decreases because every time bone remodels, a small portion of that bone is irreversibly removed from the skeleton so that by old age, an elderly woman has lost half a skeleton and whatever is left has been decayed with porosity and separation of the trabeculae. So if we now give an anti-resorptive drug, what is the effect? The main effect of the anti-resorptive drugs is to slow the rate of bone remodeling. The anti-resorptive drugs do not correct the negative balance. So the residual remodeling that is not suppressed continues to decay the bone despite compliance with therapy. And that is one of the limitations of the anti-resorptive drugs. So instead of the bone loss now being like in the orange line here without treatment, there is slowing of the loss. But you know as well as I do, when we give an anti-resorptive drug, this is not what we see with the BMD machine. It is not what we see when we look at clinical trials. We see an increase in the bone mineral density. How can a drug that stops resorption actually increase bone density? And the explanation for that is shown in this slide here, that because there is a delay in the form beginning of the bone formation in remodeling sites, and that bone formation takes three months, whereas the resorption phase took only three weeks, the holes that were dug before treatment refill. But they refill incompletely because of the negative balance. When these many holes refill, they do so at the same time as the now fewer resorption cavities are being dug because the anti-resorptive's main action is to slow the number of holes being dug. So the net, net, the sum of the fewer holes being dug plus more holes being incompletely refilled results in an increase in bone density. This is also contributed to by further mineralization. Remember, I said that at the completion of the formation phase, which takes three months, secondary mineralization can take two years. So the bone that has been deposited earlier in remodeling cycles is still, is now no longer being removed because you've slowed the rate of bone remodeling using an anti-resorptive drug, now that bone, because it's no longer removed and stays in the skeleton, it undergoes more mineralization so that part of this early increase is the refilling of the holes plus the mineralization of remodeling of matrix that was done months to years earlier. How much of each contribute, I don't know. In the untreated person, there's continued decay. The remodeling continues to be very rapid, digging holes. The refilling is incomplete, and slowly the bone is starting to decay.
with longer time now the fewer cavities that were dug early in treatment they now go into their refilling phase but they are now matched by the continued remodeling using bisphosphonates but not necessarily denosumab because mostly the bisphosphonates allow do not suppress remodeling completely whereas denosumab virtually abolishes remodeling so bone is still being excavated but more slowly while these holes are being refilled and the matrix that is no longer being removed because of the slow remodeling is undergoing secondary mineralization and for some years the bone density continues to increase because of the secondary mineralization but the bone volume the material is starting to decrease because the continued unsuppressed remodeling with its negative balance continues to decay the structure of the bone but the st diminishing structure of the bone is increasing in its mineral density predisposing to brittleness fractures And we see this now, and here's an example. During eight years of denosumab therapy, bone density continues to increase. At the spine, it continues to increase up to 96 months. Part of this is another aspect, which is probably or may be the continued modeling or the deposition of bone that is no longer being removed because remodeling is suppressed. Nevertheless, what you see here is when we look at the mineralization of trabecular bone that the density of the material is increased relative to controls in the in the green for cortical bone the same the mineral density of the tissue itself is increased and that may not necessarily be a good thing i want to just show you here and I hope that, that you can see this on, on, on your screen. When we give weak anti-resorptive drugs like calcium or raloxifene or basodoxifene, you see this initial increase in bone density. But now when we measure bone density, instead of the continued increase because of the secondary mineralization of bone, because raloxifene and basodoxifene are weak anti-resorptives, in other words, 80% of the remodeling that was there before treatment continues. These drugs only suppress remodeling by 20 to 30%. Now, without the secondary mineralization of the material, you start to see the decrease in bone density despite therapy with these weaker anti-resorptive drugs. You see the loss is similar to placebo. And this was not noted in this particular paper at all. So when we give drugs that are remodeling suppressants, we reduce the number of remodeling sites. But what that does is it reduces the number of osteons present. And you see that a control, these are the canals. Each canal is, forms, is formed by part of an osteon. And here with alendronate, there are fewer and thinner canals. When you have fewer osteons with their structure, with their central canal, with the lamella structure, and with a cement line that you can't see in this image, these structures stop micro crack progression. If there are fewer osteons formed, there are then fewer osteons to block the progression of a micro crack in a bone that increases in its mineral density of the material itself predisposing to atypical fractures in addition to the increased mineral density with prolonged with aging or with prolonged anti-resorptive therapy the amount of pentosidine sugar cross-linking collagen increases and when you cross-link collagen with sugar, you make sugar candy, which can break your teeth and can cause brittleness of the bone. 
And you can see here with prolonged therapy in animal studies with alendronate or residronate that as the concentration of pentosidine increases, it becomes the work to fracture becomes easier, lower. In other words, it's easier to snap a bone because it's more mineralized and it's more cross linked with sugar. And that's one of the limitations of the anti resorptive drugs. Remodeling continues because the anti resorptive drugs adsorb onto the bone surface. They do not penetrate into the deeper cortical bone. And so when we look at the effects of ebandronate, for example, in trabecular bone or in the, on the endocortical surface, the inner lining of the cortex, the drug suppresses bone remodeling and it increases bone strength in trabecular bone. But it doesn't do that in cortical bone because the drug doesn't get into the cortical bone. So when remodeling is occurring within cortical bone, the osteoclasts dig away the matrix, but the matrix does not have or has low concentrations, as you see here, low concentrations of the drug. And so the osteoclast is not inhibited. And so the anti resorptives the bisphosphonates, at least, not the nosomat, the bisphosphonates, do not entirely stop bone remodeling. And that continues to decay the skeleton. So let me turn my attention now to the anabolic agents and just talk about one or two things that I hope you will find interesting and, and, and educational. So when we give parathyroid hormone, which is the only drug when given intermittently on a daily basis that is currently available for use, but there's also aboloparatyroid, which is very is similar in some ways, um, that the new bone formed occurs mainly by remodeling. In other words, resorption occurs first with parathyroid hormone, and you see this crenated surface here of the resorption, and then new bone is deposited in the hole that has been dug. And hopefully, this overfills the hole, reducing the porosity that is a transitory effect of giving parathyroid hormone. New bone deposition by modeling is, is, is detected using histomorphometry by this smooth baseline surface that can be identified using certain staining and, and, and uh, microscopic techniques. And you can then measure the volume of bone deposited. Parathyroid hormone or teriparatide and aboloparatide probably produce their anabolic effect by remodeling primarily. Romososumab produces its effect mainly by modeling. With teriparatide, there is an increase in the structure of the trabecular bone. There is probably some deposition of bone on the inner surface, but there is little evidence, there's some evidence, but little of new bone deposition on the outside surface of the bone. In cortical bone, you can see that when you give parathyroid hormone, there is an increase in the porosity, and that increase in porosity occurs more in the inner part next to the marrow cavity. There's less porosity in the middle or the outer part, and then subperiosteal, in other words, beneath the outer surface of the bone, there's little porosity being formed by teriparatide. That may sound like it's a bad thing, and it may be, we don't know for sure, but the, most of the porosity is on the inner part next to the marrow, which has less biomechanical relevance. In addition, the increased remodeling in the cortical bone has a good effect. It creates new osteons. And I just explained to you that these osteons are defense mechanisms that block the progression of micro cracks through the cortical bone. In other words, the higher the osteonal density, the number of osteons per unit volume of bone, 
the greater the tensile strength or the toughness of the bone. So when you have lots of osteons, a crack tries to travel through, but it keeps bumping into osteons, preventing it from progressing. And these osteons have this lamella structure and they have this white line, which is called the cement line that deflects the micro cracks. In addition, that when we deposit new bone, there's in, in patients who, who fracture, there is a deficit in osteocytes. The osteocytes are there to detect damage and they play an important part in the initiation of bone remodeling. Well, when we give parathyroid hormone, we repopulate the newly deposited bone with its nervous system, with its osteocytic network, as shown in this particular slide here, parathyroid hormone increases the osteocyte number per unit bone. So replenishing the bone with a very essential cell for its good health. In addition, parathyroid hormone removes old bone and so it reduces the uh, sugar content of bone. So I described the increase in sugar with anti-resorptives when pentosidine is reduced giving parathyroid hormone, but this has not been really much studied in human subjects. This is animal work by a very good investigator, Dr. Sato uh, from Japan. Professor, in addition- I'm sorry to interrupt, just to let you know that there is 14 minutes left if you want to wrap up for a few questions. Uh, okay, thank you very much. All right, so let me wrap up here. The other effect is that the parathyroid hormone uh, removes old bone, more mineralized bone, and it shifts it, shifts the bone to become less fully mineralized, again, restoring its strength. And I will then uh, wind up, I'll go to my last slide, I won't summarize. And I guess the message what I'd like to get across is please, bone density was a good beginning but bone density creates a shadow called aerial bone density. We need to think about the qualities of bone. We need to think about the structure of bone, the cortical bone, trabecular bone, the microarchitecture of the osteons and the, the fine structure that are responsible for the structure of bone. And that's what we're trying to do with anabolic therapy to rebuild the micro and the macro structure of bone and to follow this, I believe, with anti-resorptive therapy. I thank you very much for your attention and I will welcome any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Professor Seaman. Um, I'm addressing myself to the audience now. If you would like to ask a few questions, there is a, a question uh, box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Please feel free to write it down and we'll go through it and answer uh, the most pertinent one to uh, Professor Simon's presentation. We have uh, 12 minutes for questions for the moment. So now is the time to, uh, to write it down and, and to send it to us. Thank you. Do I open a question box here? Um... Yes, you should open it in, uh, in large format if you can. And then... Um, okay, I... well, I've clicked on it. I can yeah. see a few popping in. Would you like me to read one of them? Yes, please. Okay, so we have, if anabolics and anti-resorptives act differently, why the combination is not an option? Yes, the combo, the excellent question. Excellent question. It is, a, it is an option. The original data suggesting a blunting of effect published in the New England Journal by Black and another paper by Finkelstein followed by an editorial by Kozler, have a look at the um, black study. Look at figures one, two, and three, and concentrate on the bar showing PTH plus uh, the anti-resorptive versus PTH. They are no different. The concept of blunting is flawed. The combinat combined therapy is a legitimate approach to therapy. However, we still do not have evidence of anti-fracture efficacy being better with combined therapy than with either drug alone. 
There is now data showing that anabolic therapy, both PTH versus residronate, is better than residronate, and romososumab is, has got better anti-fracture efficacy than uh, alendronate. So we know that, and whether the combinations, we still don't know, but it's a very good question. Thank you. Professor, another question we have from Eugene Fong. Why lowering CTX is low bone formation marker like PICP and BSAP a bad time? No, the CTX is, is so-called resorption marker. Look, the terminology of a resorption and formation marker is a misnomer. This is bad language. They are remodeling markers and you cannot distinguish, you cannot talk about bone formation or bone resorption using bone resorption and formation markers. That is just unacceptable. I know it's done, but it's wrong. Another question from Douglas Kiel. Can you explain the physiology of CAT-K inhibition and increases in BMD? Well, uh, that's a... <laughs> Well, you know, CAT-K inhibition, so cathepsin K breaks down collagen molecules. The coll increase in the collagen fragments changes the resorptive activity of the osteoclast so that it no longer digs a tunnel or a canal, it digs little pits and then moves on, reducing the bone resorption. So you make a more shallow cavity that may be more completely refilled. Uh, Douglas, but unfortunately, these drugs are not available to us, uh, the, the CAT-K, which is very, very unfortunate. Another question from uh, Bruno Camargos. As deep MAB as a pronounced rebound, what BIS presentation would be best? One year, one month, one weekly, or daily administration? No, no. I mean, denosumab should be given as it has been experimentally tested, which is on a six monthly basis. If you uh, are going to stop the, the denosumab, then have a good reason for stopping it. Otherwise, don't stop it. It's the best, most powerful anti resorptive agent we've got. This notion of the rebound. Well, I believe that if you're going to stop the drug, you should start another anti-resorptive before you stop the drug, maybe a month and a half or so before. We don't know exactly, nor do we know which anti-resorptive to give. But whichever one you give, you will not be giving an anti-resorptive as powerful as the denosumab. So at least have a good reason for stopping it. Another question from Natia. Do you recommend denosumab for osteoporosis in CKD patients who are on dialysis? Oh, that's a very good question too. I'm very nervous about doing that because of the hypocalcemia, good question. So that makes me very nervous. I think that should be monitored very, very closely. I favor the use of alternate weak actinel, but, and that's what I do. But you know, the problem is we have no randomized trials in chronic renal disease to test this. You know, so we don't know what we're doing. Okay. Um, another question from Jason. How do we approach treating a bone complication, low BMD value, secondary to hyperthyroidism among males? Well, uh, I think that a uh, proportion of the low bone density with hyperthyroidism will be reversible because that will be the reversible component that I was just talking about. Most of the loss when you reduce the number of remodeling sites, the sites that are the many sites present in high in hyperthyroidism will refill virtually incomplete, virtually completely. If it's in a premenopausal woman, it should refill completely. If it's a postmenopausal woman, it will woman, it will not. And then you should treat her anyway in the same way that you would any postmenopausal woman with your own approach. And one last question before we close this webinar. Um, is oversuppression of bone turnover a possibility with powerful anti resorptive like BIP? With, with what? Sorry, I didn't catch that. With powerful anti resorptive like BIP, is oversuppression of bone turnover a possibility? I'm not sure what you mean by VIP. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. BIP, I don't know, I'm just reading the question, maybe it's a spelling mistake. Uh, this, sorry, this was for Nate. Okay. 
Oh, I see. Well, you know, if you're suppressing bone remodeling for a long time, I believe that there is a predisposition to people getting atypical fractures. I don't know what it is, but I suspect, for example, it occurs more common commonly in Asian people, because Asian people have lower bone remodeling to start off with. So you're suppressing bone remodeling down. And I believe that's partly why the incidence of atypical fractures appears to be higher. So I think that there is a predisposition, but we need to do studies to examine what that might be. We still don't know. We're working in this area. I think we have time still for one more um, from Alina. Is nano indentation a good tool for analyzing microarchitecture? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Okay, then I'll go to another one then. Um, I think Bruno is asking me to show you the question written. He misunderstood the question. Um, let me check if I can find it back. Um, do, do you have access to your question uh, window? Well. Well, I you know there's I tick the question window, but I can't see anything in it. Oh, you can't see anything. In it. Okay, um, okay. Let me jump to another question. Sorry, uh, Bruno. Okay, how um, here it is. Or oh, as DMAB as a pronounced rebound, what BIS yes. presentation would be best? One year, one month, one weekly. Mind that we do Sorry. know when the reactivation of O class starts. My feeling is that the more frequent dosing is better. Well, we have no data. I, 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 I don't. I really feel I can't answer that question. I, I, I don't completely understand it. I didn't quite catch one day two. I don't know what you mean by one day two day. What? What's? Can you repeat that? Um, I don't know. Has DMAB has a pronounced rebound? What BIS presentation would be best? One year, one month, once we. What bisphosphonate? What bisphosphonate treatment? Yeah, I see. Oh, I see what you mean. I don't know the answer. It's not been studied. I, I, I suspect you should start the bisphosphonate early, and if you want a quick suppression, then giving a, a cluster has, drops the bone remodeling in the first month to 90%, very similar to denosumab. So if you want a quick suppression, then I would uh, recommend giving a cluster. But I suspect if you start either Fosamax or Actinel, uh, say at month four, before stopping the drug, then you'll start to see a benefit and continued treatment. But I don't know the answer really. It's just not been studied comparing different drugs. Very good. Well, Professor Simon, thank you very, very much for your time. I'd like to thank the audience as well for uh, okay. this session. Uh, you'll be asked thank to you. answer a small uh, post survey after this webinar. This is addressed to the audience. It's only five or six questions. So we invite you to go through. Okay. This uh, webinar will be recorded and available on YouTube and on IWF website as of uh, Monday latest. So I invite you to come back to it uh, should you need to. Professor Simon, thank you very much. And we keep in touch. I wish you a very nice evening. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.